Well, good morning. So glad you're here today. Before we begin, would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning? Father, we are so thankful for the way that you work uh, in our lives. Father, for the air you give us to breathe, uh, you, uh, you make our hearts to beat and our lungs to breathe and, and everything to function, Lord. You are not only our creator, Lord, but you are our sustainer. Lord, if you were to remove your hand from us, Lord, we would cease to exist. And Father, it is humbling to think that even while we are sinning against you, at that very moment while we are in the act, Father, you hold us together by your mercy and you keep our body functioning and our mind thinking even when we were thinking on things that we should not think on. Father, it's awesome to think how gracious you are. And Father, we thank you for so many things this morning. Father, we thank you for this wonderful country that we have, that we can worship in freely. Father, we thank you for the mountains and the blue sky and this wonderful weather. Lord, for our mothers and fathers and our families and and our friends and the people in this church that surround us with love. And Father, we want to thank you this morning even for the trials. Lord, we want to thank you even for the pain that we don't understand why we're going through and when it's going to end. And Father, we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love you. And so, Father, we thank you even for the trials and the pain. Father, this morning we want to lift up before your throne those who are sick, those who are suffering, those who are afflicted. Lord, come to their aid. Many of our number, Father, are dealing with, uh, uh, with various illnesses. And so, Father, we do pray in faith that you would bring healing. And yet, Lord, we ask that you help us to accept your will, whatever that may be. Father, we trust you not only to heal, but to provide, to give us uh, the funds that we need, the money and the resources, the food that we need to continue to live. Father, we lift up before your throne this morning uh, our leaders of our country, Father, our president, and those who are by his side, those who you have given in federal government and state government and local civil government. Father, whether we agree with them or not, Lord, we ask that you would bless them, that you would give them wisdom, guidance, and Father, most of all, draw them to you. And Father, now as we prepare to open your word, Lord, Father, we recognize that we, all of us, stand before you on equal ground this morning. Lord, you you are, uh, uh, Father, our God who has created us. You are the God who has created your word and, and given it to us. And Father, your word this morning is our textbook. Your Holy Spirit is our instructor and we together are your students. Father, help us to not just assimilate head knowledge, Lord, but to apply these things to our hearts, to our minds. Help us to walk away this morning as a result of your word and your Holy Spirit working in our lives, walk away changed. For your glory and your name's sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been for some time now in a series entitled The Master's Message on the Mountain. The Master's Message on the Mountain, and it deals with uh, uh, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, uh, beginning in Matthew chapter 5. And this morning we come to chapter 6. And Jesus here begins to shift gears. And this morning we want to look at how do hypocrites give to charity? How do hypocrites give to charity? You see, Jesus will address that. And thus far, Jesus has challenged in his sermon the religious leaders at every single point in their theology. 
He's saying, look, your theology is wrong. The way you approach God, your whole thinking is wrong. He was saying to them, you don't understand the theology of of hatred and murder and divorce and telling the truth and even how to love. And so he's exposed all these areas of their lives and next he will show us and he will show them that their, not only is their theology wrong, but their religious actions are just as bad as their theology. He's saying your theology is faulty and your worship is phony. Your theology is faulty, but that's not enough. Now I'm going to show you that your worship is phony. And he demonstrates this in the sections to come, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1, by addressing three different subjects. He addresses their giving, their praying, and their fasting. Why these three? Why does he, of all things, pick giving and praying and fasting? Why? Because religious practice encompasses three primary areas, and they are these. How we deal with others, how we deal with God, and then how we deal with ourselves. And so giving represents and shows how we deal with others. The subject of praying shows how we deal with God, and fasting, he shows us how we deal with ourselves, with the mortification of the flesh. And he is saying to these people, these Pharisees, these these religious leaders, he's saying to them, look, your whole approach to worshiping God is wrong. You've missed the point, he says. And so not only are they completely deficient in their religious beliefs, but now they're deficient in their religious practices as well. And in our section today, he deals with the first of these three, which is giving. And he begins by showing them, rather than telling them, this is how you give, he begins by showing them, let me tell you exactly how not to give. Sometimes that's the best way to illustrate something. Let me show you exactly how not to give. And so he begins in chapter 6 of Matthew, verse 1 through 4, and he says this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. I'd like to break this down for you if I can briefly. He begins by saying, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. The Greek word here used for seen is a word that describes a public show. It is the word theaomai from where we get our word theater. A public display And so he says, these people do it just to be seen by others. And then he uses a very interesting word, a word we are familiar with today, and that is the word hypocrite. The word has its origins in the Greek theater, and it is used to describe a person who walks up on stage and puts on a show, an actor. And this, this in, in, the Greek, in the Greek stage, this, this actor would come up and he would play various roles, you see, throughout the play. And he would put on different masks for each role that he would play. And so he'd go on stage, off stage, put on a, a mask, come on stage, act out this part, leave, come back, put on a new mask, and act out another part. And he's called a hypocrite. A stage player who acts the part of others 
one who hides his real sentiments, his real thoughts, and portrays feelings that are actually not his own. Those who ostensibly play the part of a good person for gain or applause or to appear pious is what Jesus is talking about here. That's how he applies it. Now I want you to know that there are two distinct kinds of hypocrites. There are two kinds of hypocrites. First, there are those who are not Christians, but they pretend to be. They put on a show, they put on an act, they come to church, they look the part, and really, unless you really get to know them and know their lives, they really look pretty good. I mean, they look like they're the real deal until you really see the fruit, the fruit of their lives. Not how they speak, not the things they say, but you see the fruit of their lives, and only then will it become apparent who they actually are. So first, there are those who are not Christians but pretend to be second. There are those hypocrites who are actually Christians, they are actually saved, but they go about living out their Christianity in a hypocritic way. And you see, the Pharisees made a great show of their giving to the needy. In the synagogues and on the streets, thinking they were uh, 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 proving how righteous they were, you see. Blowing horns, Jesus says, blowing a trumpet. Now, whether they actually would blow a trumpet or not, historians are divided on this because there isn't a whole lot of proof in, in the historical Jewish writings of the first century to prove whether they actually blew horns. However, they did have uh, something in which they would actually uh, give their money. Uh, some scholars believe that the word used for horn here, shofar, which is a trumpet, refers to the whole that is in the public alms chest into which money would be dropped which would be allotted for the service of the poor and such holes because they were wide at one end and grew gradually narrow towards the other were actually termed shofaroth, trumpets. And these trumpet holes were crooked, narrow above and wide below in order to prevent Fraud, And so an ostentatious man would, uh, who wishes to, to make a noise, to make a spectacle, to wish to attract the attention, would throw his money in this, in this horn, in this trumpet, this opening, with some force. And thus it would be said that he is sounding the trumpet. During the festival... Of Muram, faithful Muslims give alms to the poor in the name of Allah. And their manner of giving is to erect on the streets a stage in public and then sound trumpets to call the poor to receive gifts of rice and other kinds of food. You see, the world is full of religious people full of religious people who are lost, whose religion is a masquerade, a hypocrisy, an act, a theater performance. And we see it quite regularly today. Celebrities flaunting charitable donations in the media. Rarely is a dollar by a celebrity given without the flash of a photo shoot, without some kind of talk show interview or a magazine article. They love the attention. But God does not reward hypocrisy. Why? (laughs) Well, Jesus says quite clearly, because their reward, the reward of these hypocrites who who when they give, you know, clang cymbals and, 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 and blow horns and blow trumpets and get on the media and show pictures, their reward, Jesus says, is given to them in full. That terminology that's used there is actually used of a legal business transaction, a financial transaction, wherein one pays something and then receives a receipt for what he has gotten. So Jesus says, look, their reward has been paid in full. They're paid up. How? Well, simple. They're paid up through men's applause, you see. They're paid up through people seeing what they have given. Oh, isn't that a wonderful guy? Did you you see what he did? 
It's like our little guy up there, right, on the screen. Doesn't he just look cocky? I wonder if he gave 5,000 or uh, 500 or 5. But you see, that's the attitude. And Jesus says that won't be rewarded. So the question then is, how does Jesus want us to give? Here's how Jesus wants us to give. But the Lord said that in giving, one should not even let his left hand know what his right hand is doing. It should be so secret, so secret, that the giver himself readily forgets what he gave. And in this way, he demonstrates true righteousness before God and not before people. Now, before we go further, I want to say something to you. I I feel I need to say this. May I say that for those who do not know me well yet, I intentionally avoid the subject of giving as much as possible. I mention it only when I have absolutely no choice because God's word speaks on it within the section that we happen to currently be covering as we go systematically through the entire Bible. In fact, if you notice, here at New Hope, we don't even pass the plate at all. And we do this for three reasons. One, so that we don't make our guests uncomfortable or feel like they're compelled to give. Secondly, so that we don't make a show out of our giving. And then thirdly, so that giving is not prompted out of guilt, but carefully planned and purposed well ahead of time in the heart. But the subject of giving, you see, is unpopular because it has been abused so much by so many. And yet it is interesting that Scripture speaks on money and giving almost more than any other subject. Why? Well, here's why. Because you see, what a person does with their money, what a person does with their money is a direct window into their heart. You see, you, you, you whip out your checkbook and pull it out of your back pocket and open it up and show it to me and then tell me where you spent your time last week, I'll tell you exactly where your heart is. You show me your checkbook and you show me your schedule calendar and I'll show you where your heart is. I'll show you what you love. I'll show you what you're enthralled with. And Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, think about what's most important to you, most precious to you, that's where your heart is. Now, let me say this at the outset. God doesn't need your money. It's period. God doesn't need your money. God can do anything he wants without a penny from you ever. He doesn't need your money to advance his kingdom. His work is not at your mercy However, even though God does not need your money, you, however, need to give for your sake. Why? Because when we give, we put ourselves within the framework of God's blessing. Giving leads to blessing, our own blessing. The more you give, the more you get. The reaping is proportionate to the sowing. You know, a farmer goes out into a field and he takes everything he has. I mean, I know because I lived in Nebraska for a while. So these farmers, I mean, these millions and millions of dollars, they soak themselves dry on fertilizer and pesticide and the right kind of stuff in the ground and the right kind of tractor and the right kind of seed with the right kind of ingredients and all this stuff. I don't even know how it all works. But I know that they invest everything they've got into this crop. And then they hope and pray that this thing's going to produce something. And that's how it is when we give to God. So even though God doesn't need your money, you need to give. The reaping is proportionate to the sowing. Now, I'm not just talking about the reaping being proportionate to the sowing in terms of money. I am not up here telling you a prosperity gospel. I'm not saying, if you give $100, God's going to give you $200. That's nonsense. I'm not saying that, okay? So don't, don't go home and say I said that. But here's what I am saying. The reaping is proportionate to the sowing. Whether it's money, whether it's blessings, God will bless you to the proportion that you give. 
Proverbs 11.25, whoever brings blessings will be enriched and the one who waters will himself be watered. As you give to God, God blesses you out of that which you've given and gives it to you again so that you can give it again. Deuteronomy 16.10, then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a, catch this, free will offering. From your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. So you give according to the blessing of God, and God blesses you with the gift again. Now, what was Jesus teaching here? As, as we've seen in Matthew, Jesus, Jesus basically says, here, look, here's what you guys are saying, you religious teachers. Now let me tell you what I think on the subject, and of course when he, when he tells us what the truth is on the subject, he always goes back to the Old Testament and reveals what the Old Testament actually had to say on the subject. So Jesus is teaching that which the law of the Old Testament already taught. And the law of the Old Testament commanded that we give to the poor. I'd like to read you, I'd like to read to you a few passages just from the Old Testament. I'd like the, the Scripture to speak rather than me speaking. So let me read you a few passages, if I may. Leviticus 19.10, you can turn there or you can just listen. We'll read several. Leviticus 19.10, And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither you shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor. Leviticus 25.35, If your brother becomes poor, and cannot maintain himself, you shall support him as though he were a stranger and a sojourner, and he shall live with you. Ooh, I better get that spare bedroom cleaned up. Take no interest from him, take no profit from him, but fear your God that your brother may live beside you. Deuteronomy 15, 7, following, if among you one of your brothers should become poor, in any of your towns within your land that the Lord has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against him, against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend to him sufficient for his need, whatever that may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought, thought, in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cries out to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. <laughs> you shall give to him, here's how, freely. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake, for there will never cease to be the poor in your land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your poor brother. To the needy and to all the poor in your land. Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deeds. Proverbs 22, 9, whoever gives generously will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. Ezekiel 16, 49, behold, this was the guilt. Check this out. Check this passage out. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Remember that place? Check this out. Here's what God says about Sodom. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. Here it comes. She and her daughters, the other cities, had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, and did not aid the poor. Proverbs 29, 7, a righteous man is concerned for the rights of the poor. A wicked man does not understand such concerns. Isaiah 58, 10, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness 
and your gloom will be turned to noon day. We talk about being a city set on a hill, about being salt and light. This tells us how to do that. <laughs> you give to the poor and your light will shine. Isaiah 61 the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring... This is a messianic prophecy, by the way. Check this out. This is a prophecy about Jesus before he ever came. Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me. Who has sent me? The Lord God has sent Jesus to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, that's those in prison, to open the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jeremiah twenty two sixteen, 16. He championed the cause of the poor and the needy, and then it was well with him. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? Oof, did you catch that? The Lord said, isn't that what it means to know me? In other words, isn't that what absolutely defines my people? To champion the cause of the poor. There are in the Bible two kinds of giving. There are in the Bible two kinds of giving that a Christian can do. One, there is the systematic, structured kind of giving like we do in church on Sunday morning where you lay by in the store and prepare for the end of the week so that you can give so that ministries can continue. Like 1 Corinthians 16, where Paul commanded that we do that. We are to every week face the reality of the stewardship of our money. And then there is a second kind of giving. And that is giving to the poor and needy. And this is the subject of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6.1. It's not giving in church, not giving in the synagogue. It's, it's, it's the subject of giving to the poor. How do I know this? Well, because it's giving your alms, you see. When you give to the poor, you give to the Lord. Why? Because all giving to the poor is investing with God. We are commanded to give to those who cross our path, who are in deep need. Now, let me, let me give you a little aside right here, a little side note. Make sure that the one you give to, the one you give to is truly in need. Why do I say that? Here's why. Because there are many, many out there, especially in America, who are healthy, well-fed, professional beggars who can work just fine. Don't give to them. Give to those who are truly in need. When you give to the poor, you give to the Lord. By the way, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, For even when you were, we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, don't let him eat. So be careful who you give to. Be wise, be shrewd as you're being generous. Now Jesus, by the way, sets up this Old Testament stuff. He, he, he tells us wh uh, how we ought to give. And he expects us to give to the poor. Not just the Old Testament, but Jesus expects us to give to the poor. Jesus expected his followers would give alms to the poor in keeping the Old Testament. In fact, in fact, sharing the message of salvation, the good news of the gospel with the poor and with prisoners and with the sick and with the social outcasts is the very reason that Jesus said his father sent him to this earth. Don't believe me? Listen to Christ's own words. This is Christ's mission statement in his own words. This is the first time he began uh, basically to, to say, hey, this, this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm about. This is found in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. This is where all the Jews are on the Sabbath day. It's like coming to church, you know. 
And he stood up to read. That was the custom in that day. He would stand up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll. Now, the scroll of Isaiah, by the way, okay, this isn't a book. This isn't, you know, like, like this, like you flip pages. I mean, this is a scroll, right? And it's got the whole book of Isaiah on If you laid it out, I mean, it would take up most of this place, right? The scroll of Isaiah, as it was handed to him, he grabbed it and he turned to a very specific spot. Catch this spot that he turned to. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. This is the prophecy about him. Isn't this ironic? So he's standing up and he himself is reading the prophecy about him and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me I'll say it again, the Spirit of the Lord, that's His Father, is upon me, Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, because He has anointed me to do what? Here's what He's anointed me to do. Here's His mission statement. Here's why He's here. To proclaim the good news, that's the gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, that's those in prison, and recovering of sight to the blind, And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That means anybody who's socially oppressed in any way. The downtrodden, the outcast, the disenfranchised. The least of these. And that day would be children and women and tax collectors, even though they were rich. The outcasts of society, you see. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down in the eyes of Uh, all in the synagogues were fixed on him and he began to say to them today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing Mary Mary upon hearing that she would uh, give birth to the Lord gave what we call her Magnificat and Mary said this is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit she spoke these words my soul magnifies the Lord And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he, that's God, has looked on the humble estate of his servant, for behold, now, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts and he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with food and with good things and those who are rich he has sent away empty. In a biblical commentary by Dr. John MacArthur, he writes these words, quote, Christ's concern for the poor and the outcasts is one of the central themes throughout the gospel. Matthew 11:2 says, "Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word through his disciples and said to him, "Are you the one who is to come or shall we look to another?" John wasn't sure at that moment. He was under a lot of stress, he's in prison. He's like, "You know, can we just make sure that this Jesus is, is really the Messiah? I want to know." I got to know. And so he sent out word, and here's Jesus' response. Here's Jesus' proof to John the Baptist that he's really the guy. Here it comes. Here's what Jesus said to John the Baptist. And Jesus said, go tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, deaf hear, dead are raised, the poor have the good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. couple more passages. James chapter 2, verse 5. I, I want you to, I'm going to read to you three more, four more passages. I want you to listen to these carefully. James 2, 5. Listen, my beloved brothers. Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? 
James 2.14, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says to you he has faith but does not have works? Can that kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warm, be filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not follow with works, is dead. Luke 14.12, Jesus said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner, you know how you guys like have barbecues and you invite people over, you have banquets, right? Check this out. Here's Jesus telling you what to do when you have these things. When you give a dinner or a banquet, you know, Super Bowl party, right? Don't invite just your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return and then you'll be repaid for what you have done. But when you give a feast... Invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind and you will be blessed. Why? Because they cannot repay you. And you will be pay, repaid at the resurrection of the just. Scripture tells us in Matthew 5, Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who wants to borrow from you. And lastly, Luke eight fourteen. And as for what fell among thorns... Remember this, this, this parable? The parable of the seed that was scattered on different kinds of soil? Check this out. Here's, here, here's the seed that was scattered among thorns. As for what fell among thorns, they are those who hear. That means they hear the gospel. They hear the word of God. But, but as they go on their way after hearing the gospel, sounds good to them, right? Sound, gospel sounds good. But then as they go on their way, they are choked. By? What could they be choked by? Simple. The cares of this world, the riches of this world, that's the money in your pocket, money in your bank account, and the pleasures of life, all that stuff you're used to and you like, really don't want to get rid of. The word is choked out. And their fruit does not mature. You see, this is the heart of Jesus. He always extended himself to the needy and to the poor. Now, how do you give? I want to give you some practical ideas on how do you, practical biblical ideas on how you give. Jesus says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's the, it's the idea of you're walking along, you see a poor person, and as you're walking, you just simply reach in and you do this. And you keep walking and your left hand doesn't even see what your right hand did. That freely, that naturally you give, that without hesitation, you just reach in and, and you go on. You don't, <clears throat> somebody looking, <whistles> let me take my checkbook out and I'm going to, so you're not drawing attention to yourself. You're not drawing attention to yourself. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. By the way, isn't it interesting? It takes two hands to clap for yourself. If your left hand doesn't know, it'd be kind of hard, right? Okay. Uh, you shouldn't even be able to remember the last time you, came, you gave. Some give to the needy and wait to see if the needy are grateful. You ever met that guy? I gave to him and they didn't even care. They didn't, even, they didn't even say thank you. I mean, look, I'm not expecting, you know, some huge parade or anything, but come on, a thank you? Couldn't you just, you know, throw me that? Went out of my way. No thank you. Let me tell you this. If someone's ingratitude bothers you, then you've given for the wrong reason. You've given to receive the gratitude of men. How can you expect to receive a reward for the gratitude of God? One cannot be rewarded. Catch this if you catch nothing else. You cannot receive a reward for giving from both man and God. You will receive one or the other, but you can't have both. You choose. You pick. It's your, it's your choice. Jesus says they have their reward. And yet at this point, I also have to wonder how many professing Christians... Give nothing to the poor. 
They're not even at the level of the Pharisees. Okay. Lastly, some principles of biblical benevolence. Some principles of biblical benevolence. One, uh, I want to talk to you about the attitude of giving. Here's the attitude you should have in giving. Three points. First, giving should be sacrificial and generous. David said in 2 Samuel uh, 24, 24, I will not make sacrifices to the Lord which do not cost me anything. Second, not only should it be sacrificial, but second, it should not depend on how much you have. You, you know, you hear people say, you know, right now I'm not doing real good, but I tell you what, man, when, when I get that new job, then I'm going to start giving. I'm not doing real good right now, but when my ship comes in, let me tell you something, when your ship comes in, you'll sail away on it and keep feeding your own pleasures just like you're doing now. How can I say that? How dare I say that? Here's how. Check this out. Luke chapter 16, 10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is dishonest in much. Thirdly, giving must be determined personally from the heart based on need. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. Like if you come in this, uh, this morning, you give, whether it's giving to church or whether you give to a poor guy, and you give because you like feel guilty or something, just quit. Don't do that. It's crazy. Don't give because you, you're guilty. You don't do it reluctantly. God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So giving, when you give, must be out of love, not out of law. Did you know? I'm going to blow you away right here, okay? Did you know there's no such thing as tithing in the New Testament? <gasps> How am I going to get my paycheck? <laughs> Guys, there's no tithing in the New Testament. It just isn't there. Sorry to break your bubble. Sorry, all you pastors out there listening online right now. <laughs> there's no tithing in the New Testament. There's giving. There's giving. Giving free will out of the heart. No rules. No regulations. It's what you give ungrudgingly, cheerfully from the heart, not out of law. Now, next, I want to share with you three principles on the rewards of giving. What are the three rewards of giving? First, giving is investing with God. It puts you in the cycle of blessing. Luke 6.38, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be put into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Second, giving correlates directly with the effectiveness of your ministry, you who are concerned with spreading the gospel, you who have any interest in winning this community for Christ and seeing thousands of people come to, to Christ, let me tell you this, your giving, the extent to which you give, correlates directly with your effectiveness in ministry. Luke 16, 11 through 12. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, if you have not been faithful with, with money, who will entrust you with true riches? If you have not been faithful in, in that which is another's, who will entrust you to give you something that's your own? God will not give you stewardship over souls if you cannot be trusted with the stewardship of your money. And then thirdly, the extent of your giving on earth, check this out, the extent of your giving on this earth <laughs> determines the extent of your reward in heaven. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. I thought, we went to heaven on the basis of grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It has nothing to do with works, right? You're right. You will go to heaven on the basis of Jesus Christ's blood, period, and no other reason. But when you get there, when you get there, the extent of your reward will be determined by what you did on this earth. Do you know that? 
Luke 12, 33. Sell your possessions and, you, and give them to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in heaven that does not fail. How do you say to get treasure in heaven that does not fail? Simple. Sell your possessions and give them to the needy. <laughs> where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In conclusion, you know we all have our own little trumpets, don't we? I mean, look, we may not carry around the big trombone and start blasting it, you know, but, but look, we've all got, we've all got our little trumpets. We all in some way, even though we may, we may, you know, not pass the plate around here and we may just walk back there casually to that box back there and just whoosh, 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 drop in our check. But wouldn't it be kind of nice if just somebody saw us do that? Back of our heads, right? Wouldn't it be nice if just someone saw, you know, I gave to this, this, this homeless guy. Wouldn't it be nice if one of my, my parishioners were just dri- driving down the road and saw me giving to this guy? That would be cool, right? See, we need to get that out of our heads. We need to get that completely out of our heads, and that's the whole point that Jesus is saying here. Look, here's the bottom line. Your need to be recognized by people is in direct proportion to your lack of faith in God's ability to reward you. As you live your Christian life, be real. People are sick and tired. This world is sick and tired of fake, phony, hypocritical Christians. Live your life and be real. And let your reward be from God and from God alone. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, like, you know, you've heard about him, pretty cool guy, you know, he's got some cool sayings, but you don't really know him. If you don't know him, maybe you've been faking it. That's the worst hypocrisy of all. Because that kind of hypocrisy will make you think you're going to heaven when you're going to hell. All your work, let me tell you this, all of your works, all of your good things you do, there's lots of people out there that give to charity, all of your good works, Scripture says, are filthy rags before God. You can't give enough. You can't give enough to earn salvation, to earn heaven. It's not going to happen. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, understand that you can't earn your way there. You can't be a good enough person. There's no such thing. And if you've been fooling yourself into thinking you can somehow earn God's approval, you know, I talk to my mom all the time. She says, I'm a good person. Don't kill anybody, you know, don't steal. But if you're here this morning and you've been fooling yourself into thinking you could earn God's approval, I've got some good news for you too. And that's this. Today is the day you can surrender your life to him. Today is the day you can like quit fooling around, quit playing church, quit playing Christian, quit playing good guy, and completely surrender your life to him, and he will wash you clean and make it possible for you to live a life completely free of hypocrisy. Do you want to know that you're... Do you want to know without any shadow of a doubt that you're absolutely right with God, that you're absolutely going to heaven. Let me tell you something. Religion will never get there. Religion will never get you there. You don't need religion. You don't need more rules, more rituals, more regulations. What you need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can have that relationship today by repenting of your sins saying, you know what, I'm tired of this stuff. I don't want to do this anymore. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, confessing Him as the Lord of your life. And that means surrendering your life to Him by becoming His disciple, by giving Him control, that desperate thing we want to hold on to, giving Him control over your thoughts, over your words, over your actions, maybe even over your wallet. Give him control, and he'll save you. 
Father, we thank you, Lord, for the salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you allow us to participate in a small way, Father, in giving back to you what you've already given to us, in doing the work of your kingdom, in doing your will, in helping people, Father. Father, that you, that you would allow us to, to come to someone who has no food and, 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 and is living just destitute and that you would, you would give us enough resources that we can actually help out and, and reach out and touch that person. That is tremendous. What a privilege, Father. Father, thank you for that. Help us to love like Jesus loved Help us to be, give, be merciful as he was merciful. Help us to give as he gave with a willing, glad heart. And Father, most of all, thank you for the salvation that you offer that comes only through Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.